So this is lecture 24 of ECE 20, uh, 23, uh, 5312. I was about to say 2305. Wrong course, sorry. Okay, so last class we talked about um, when we have a sync time domain pulse that gives us, especially when in the frequency, it's finite bandwidth and it truncates at W and minus W, where W is equal to 1 over 2T, which is symbol period, you get these beautiful this beautiful situation where at every sampling instant t, or multiple of t, you get the desired sample and everything else is weighed to zero, every other ISI contribution. Now, we reach one of the first of two Nyquist criterion. In this case, this is the Nyquist time domain condition for zero ISI. There's also a frequency domain one, which we'll look at later, because the problem with the time domain, as I mentioned in the last lecture, in lecture 23, is the fact that to realize this zero ISI criterion, this uh, condition for a time domain filter, using a sync pulse is impossible unless you have an infinite number of taps, right? Your impulse response is from minus infinity to infinity. If you truncate, you no longer have a sync pulse, or you no longer have zero crossings. Now, what we have written on the board, this guy here, is my sample, my frequency response. So it could be anything. So I could have any filter. It just happens that sync pulses were pretty cool. So let's say here's zero, here's T. Here's 2t, here's minus t, here's minus 2t. So let's say I have my peak here, and it can go anywhere. Oh, um, missed it, darn. Zoop. Okay. Zero crossing. I'm just going to move it there. And then zero crossing. So, and then let's say you have something here. Yeah, that's not even a function anymore because, <laughs> but anyways, like, pardon my, like, fancy drawing style. Um, let's say something like this. Zoop. Zero crossing. Zoop. Zero crossing. I don't care what happens in between each one of these guys. As long as they cross there and the desired sample is kept at whatever. So, all this stuff in between, I don't really care about it. Because what happens is that stuff won't factor in. I'm going to throw it away because I'm only sampling those desired time instances. Right? So that's what the Nyquist criterion thing or condition is here. It just says all I care about is where I start sampling because that's what's going to factor into my ISI, nothing else. Now, if we work this out and we have these train of sync pulses, what do we have? We essentially have this sort of shifted version of syncs. Okay? And what happens is because we know that the sync is 1 at k equals n and 0 at k not equal n, right? It's almost like a delta. We get this guy and nothing else. Now, there are several problems with this. First of all, can you come up with a, with a pulse, especially a sync pulse, which satisfies this for a finite duration, right? It's great if you have an infinite duration because then sync will be realizable, but we don't have infinite time, right? And then the other thing, and this is the bad thing about sync pulses, the rate at which they decay. So let's, let's go back to... And the problem is, let's say I sample here. Let's say I sample here, sample here, sample here, sample here, sample here. Theoretically, I should be sampling there, right? First of all, look at the rate at which this decays. Not so good. It's just like 1 over whatever, t. Here's the other problem. What happens if I accidentally kind of slip and I have a timing offset in my sampling? 
That's not so bad. But imagine I have the same offset here. Wow, the ISI quickly gets realized. So this is the problem with, with these types of pulses. And um, they don't decay all that fast. And if you have a bit of a timing offset with your sampling, you are in trouble. Because what ends up happening is you get significant ISI super duper fast. Okay? So that's, that's the problem with these types of pulses. And they don't truncate very well. Okay? So that's what's described here. And so we give this type of pulse a name. We call it Nyquist 1. So Nyquist 1 pulses is when we have you know, our, our HT essentially has these zero crossings at the desired sampling instant. Okay? But what happens is these types of pulses, if you have a sampling offset or you cannot truncate the waveform but you end up doing it, you either don't get zero crossings anymore or you, if you have timing offsets, T naught, then you actually don't have no ISI either. So it's not so good. And that's what's actually explained by the mathematics here. Suppose you have that T naught factor introduced. What ends up happening is you get a little bit of that offset and it could be a lot of problems. So we're going to do Nyquist 2 pulses. And Nyquist 2, as of this morning, I was talking with uh, Matthew. And I think most of you have used at one point in your lives raised cosine pulses. So that's Nyquist 2. So what is the Nyquist 2 condition? The Nyquist 2 condition, OK, so think about it. Nyquist 1, it's a delta at the sampling instant, desired 1, and 0 everywhere else, right? So it's a delta. What's the frequency representation of a delta? Flat. So what a, the Nyquist 2 condition essentially means if you have the frequency representation of an impulse response, and if you take it and its folded spectra copies that are modulated to um, like a base set to the next period, right? So one over t, and you add right across from minus raise cosine pulses. Wonderful. So in the big box that I have here, this is the frequency representation of a raised cosine pulse. Here's a quick question. Is a root No. It's not. It's not. What happens is if you take a square root Nyquist pulse, it, um, it's, uh, sorry, square root raised cosine pulse, it's not Nyquist. It's not Nyquist 2. And you can apply. If, all you need to do is plot its frequency response and then do the folded spectra. You will not have something perfectly flat. Just try it out. So exercise for the student. So what happens is um, when you, let's say the time domain representation of HRC of F is this guy here. And so what we're looking for essentially is when we overlap the spectra. So we have one spectra centered at 0. We're going to have another spectra, copy of that, centered at 1 over t, and then 1 over minus t. And what we'll see is that the area here and the area here will actually sum together to be a flat line. So if we do that, what happens is that combined with the fact that it actually, the distortion, the, the, sort of the rate at which it decays is actually 1 over n cubed. It actually converges really quickly. So it dies off because what pulse does. It doesn't die off for a hell of a long time. And the raised cosine pulse in frequency domain? And even in very bad limit, it's, it's just like it's a very limited signal. It doesn't go from minus infinity to infinity. It's a very nice signal. So let's look at this more carefully. So this Nyquist 2 pulse, so let's look in frequency domain. So let's suppose that this H of F here, this. So let's say we take minus W to W. And what we do is, 
suppose we, we, we break this guy up, this H of F into these slivers. And so what we're doing, instead of integrating this, or we're trying to find a Fourier transform of this find H of T, what we do is we find the individual Fourier transform of each segment and add it together. This is legit. Why? Inverse Fourier transform? Linear operator, right? And this guy, so what we're doing is we can either integrate the entire region or segments. If we do that, what we end up getting is this thing. And what we'll find out is, let's say, like from this, let's, let's say we let f equal to lambda, which is another frequency term. And it's modulated, it's shifted by k over t. So we're, we're basically taking some sort of frequency sliver, or this h. We're looking at this overall h expression, and we're shifting it. So, wh so what happens is, instead of moving our limits of integration over to the next guy, to the next guy, what we're doing is we're taking the h, we're keeping our limits of integration, shifting it over that, right? Right? That's what we're doing here. Equivalent which is what I, what I was referring to before. Is that the frequency no ISI domain condition, if you do that calculation, which in this case, you know, we have a constant C, right, right across, across all the folded spectra, what does that give you? At the end of the day, it's a rectangular wave, right? It's a rectangular signal from minus 1 over 2t to 1 over 2t. That gives us a sync pulse, right? And then it's sampled, right? Like here, it's t over t. And if you let it equal nt, you get your zero crossings. And that's what you have here. So in summary, the no ISI time domain condition means we only, only at the desired sampling instant do we have a non-zero impulse response, and everywhere else is a zero crossing. The no ISI frequency domain just means that our equivalent frequency response is a constant, right? And across just that sliver from minus minus 1 over 2t to two, 1 over 2t. And we have an h equivalent that's represented by all these folded spectra copies. Now, let's do one example. So this is the fun part. So the first one is very easy. So let's say we take our um, Nyquist 1 pulse. So let's say we take a sync pulse. What is it in the frequency domain? It's equal to a rectangular pulse from minus 1 over 2t to 1 over 2t. Now let's create the folded spectra of this thing. So what you've got is if you center this at 1 over t and minus 1 over t, what do you get? So let's actually draw that. So what happens is you have a signal here. Okay. So let's say that's our first one, our H of F, right? And then what happens is we shift this guy by one over T and one and minus one over T. And even though it's badly drawn, there's no overlap, but it's perfectly flat. Now, let's say we take the, that raised cosine window, right, in the frequency domain. How does that look like? So I'll use a different color. So first of all, 
So let's say that's 0. So let's say we have it's a plateau. I have something that looks like this. It's badly drawn, I'm sorry. So what happens is we usually have like a roll-off factor that's beta. And then what happens is we take the shifted version of this. Right? And so if you sum that together, again, you get that flat version. So we know that that satisfies the frequency domain criterion for Nyquist pulse shape, right? So let, let's take it another step. And this one's not as obvious. How about this trans guy here? Is he Nyquist? What happens is, if you, this, this is actually a, always a fun example. Let's say we take this triangle, and we add it to two shifted versions of that triangle at minus t, 1 over t, and, min and plus 1 over t. This will also produce a flat line. Intuitively, even before you even draw it, you should say, yeah, yeah. What that will do is it will create a triangular pulse with twice the width. And so what is, what is the convol what's convolution in the, in the frequency domain? It's multiplication time domain. Sync squared pulses are most definitely Nyquist as well. The zero crossing, what's z zero crossing squared? Still zero crossing. How about the desired sample squared? Still the desired sample. We don't care about the thing in between. Beautiful, huh? The only difference with a sync squared pulse is that no negative values. What you're going to get is something that looks like this. So that's what happens when you multiply a sync pulse with itself. What you'll get is this. The zero crossings are still going to be pronounced, so that still makes it Nyquist 1. And you have the desired sampling instant. That's a max. Okay? Ooh. Now, you can do the math, and it should come out to about the same. And you can do it for both sides. And it turns out that it has... It, it is definitely an ISI pulse. So that, um, what we looked at in this lecture essentially is sort of like we wrapped up things in terms of how ISI affects sort of the error performance and the bounds. And more importantly, we looked at the different types of transmit, um, well, not transmit filters, but sort of like what is the end-to-end -end impulse response that we would need for a transmission system in order to guarantee no ISI. So you might say, OK, so some of you probably have played with raised cosine filters, right? So you have maybe, so what, what you do is you want the overall end-to-end -end response to be Nyquist. So what you want is you probably have a noise channel and you want to do pulse shaping, right? So what do you do? Square root raised cosine at the transmitter, square root raised cosine at the receiver. What happens when you convolve two square root raised cosines? You get a raised cosine window that is Nyquist. Now, what happens is later on in this course, we'll be dealing with equalizers. And what do equalizers do? Is when we have a not nice situation where we have a, um, some filter in the middle that's not playing nice, and we have to sort of choose to deal with it by splitting some of the processing to the transmitter and the filter and some of it at the receiver. And then we have, let's say, some adaptive regime, and we'll look at things like decision feedback and zero forcing equalizers. But there is also, if you know what the channel impulse response is, you know what your transmit filter is, you know what the receive filter is, end to end to end is zero ISI. And then you need to figure out how to transmit and receive to make sure that for that channel, assuming it stays static, you can achieve zero ISI. All right? So that, that's going to be the next lecture, in fact. OK? So what we've seen so far is really our introduction to the band-limited channel.
this is really important for any of you that are interested in looking at ways of mitigating ISI through means like equalization. Oh, and there's my other favorite. There's something called pre I'm not sure how many. So with that, that concludes lecture 24. Okay. Somehow I always make it before uh, 8.50. I